Bum, 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 bum. Oh my goodness, I actually forgot my coffee. I'm starting coffee with Scott Adams without coffee. Luckily, I've got some water here, and it's just as delicious. So please join me by grabbing your cup, your mug, your glass, your tankard, your stein, your chalice, your thermos, fill it with your favorite liquid. At the moment, I'll be drinking water, but join me now for the unparalleled pleasure, which is the simultaneous sip. <sighs> Ugh, that's just water. I hope you've got something better than water. Well, today is a very special day, a very amazing day. Um, if, you're, if you've been following the saga of my Don Quixote attempts to slay the hoax called the fine people Charlottesville hoax, you know that this week, success. Now, I didn't do it alone. I'll name some names later. But this is an amazing day. Now, for those of you who need some catch up, the, the fine people hoax was one of the biggest hoaxes ever perpetrated on this country that wasn't the uh, Russia collusion hoax. It's the same importance because it really ripped at the, the soul of the nation, as Biden uh, correctly said. But it was a hoax, and this week uh, major media entities have, have accepted that. I'll get to that in a moment. So the, the hoax was this, precisely. Uh, for two years, both uh, Democrats, including now several Democrat uh, candidates for president, as well as the press and the pundits have been saying on the year for, I don't know, two years straight, that the president, and here's the hoax, called white nationalists and neo-Nazis marching in Charlottesville, quote, fine people. Now, what he actually said, because they always cut off the part where he said at the same time, and without prompting, nobody asked, nobody asked him an additional question, Without prompting, he made sure he clarified his remarks at the time, back in 2016, and he said, quote, um, bum, 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 bum. Uh, he said, um, he, quote, I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists because they should be condemned totally. But he had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, Okay. So he said, in the clearest language, the exact opposite of what the media and the Democrats have been quoting him as for two years straight. Now, you'd say to yourself, Scott, this should be the easiest hoax that anybody ever debunked. For, and for over a year now, I've been working on this, and where I would show somebody the transcript, the actual words that are very clearly the direct opposite of what the hoax is. And then I show people the actual video clip, and often I still can't convince people that it really happened, amazingly. But something happened recently. <laughs> Two things happened recently that completely changed uh, the, the, let's say, the mindset of the public. Number one was the Russia collusion hoax fell apart. It's the most... Uh, most egregious, you know, high-profile hoax that most of us have ever lived through. And it primed people to understand that there could be something that they think they saw with their own eyes. They think they, they, think they heard it. It's been reported by every media outlet. Every important, credible person has said it's true. And it's not. So we, we all lived through that with the Russia collusion hoax, and that primed people to understand that they could be positive something is true, hear it from everybody credible, and it's not. So that was the first thing that happened, just by coincidence. Second thing that happened was Joe Biden put the hoax back in the headlines by uh, doing what only the human gaff machine, that's what I call Biden, that's my own nickname for him. <clears throat> He's the human gaff machine. He, decided, he decides to do his uh, announcement for president by leading off repeating the hoax. Now, that, of course, put it back in the headlines 
<clears throat> at the same time, the public was primed to understand how easily they could be hoaxed, and at the same time that I had collected over the past year a whole bunch of sources and links to address everybody's concerns about this. So there was a little package that you could just send to people, say, look, here's this. Now, uh, on top of that, um, a number of people joined the effort to try to write this thing, notably among them, Joel Pollack of Breitbart, uh, Steve Cortez, contributor to CNN, and of course, Carpe Donctum, who you know as the, uh, <laughs> the meme master to the president, uh, as well as everybody else. So with lots of help from notably the, the ones I mentioned, the, the, so Carpe Donctum made a meme which turned this into a visual and video uh, response to the ho hoax. And you know how important visual stuff is. So that was a big deal. But also Steve Cortez wrote an article for Real Clear Politics, I think. And Joel Pollack wrote for Breitbart. So now I had extra sources that every time the hoax came up, I could say, here, look at it in context. Look at one of these articles. Now, I have to mention this because this is so much fun. Do you know the book Moneyball? Yeah, it's, it's the, uh, the book that talks about uh, Billy, whoever the, um, Billy, is it Billy Bean? The baseball manager who managed to build winning baseball teams using statistics and scrappy players who were not superstars. So, but although they were not superstars, they had good statistics in certain ways. And when he put them together, the people who were not superstars could create great teams. Yeah, Michael Lewis wrote the book Moneyball about this influence. And, and I noticed that Trump, somewhat accidentally, I suppose, plays Moneyball. Because if you look at you know, the, the people I just mentioned, you know, if you were to ask the big power players in Washington, hey, who are the most powerful people in politics? The people they would not mention would be me, Steve Cortez, Joel Bullock, and Carpe Donctum. All right, we, we have our strengths. I think we're all, uh, you know, uh, we're all capable people, but probably we would not be mentioned in the top 10 of people who could make a difference. But Trump has somehow weaponized all kinds of people to sort of... Uh, to respond to things in very effective ways on social media, which is what happened. So anyway, there was a, a lot of pushback for the last week or so. I've been pushing it hard with a tweet thread. The, the folks I mentioned have been pushing it hard. Uh, all of you who are watching this Periscope, many of you have been retweeting it. I, I think Don Jr. retweeted uh, Elise Carpe Dunctum's meme. And it caused so much um, attention that uh, <laughs> that people started writing articles about me and r calling me alt-right, which is the opposite of what I am. I'm actually left of Bernie, as most of you know. Um, but they also refer to me as a cartoonist to minimize my involvement and make me look like a tinfoil hat kind of guy. They could have mentioned that I wrote a best-selling book about persuasion and that I spent the last three years talking almost exclusively about hoaxes and illusions and how to, how to get yourself out of them. In fact, my new book, Loser Think, that'll come out in November, is all about this topic. So I'm actually kind of immersed in the topic of identifying and getting rid of hoaxes. But they call me the Dilbert guy when they write about me so that they can minimize that. Now, um, here's the success part. <clears throat> the first success was getting Wikipedia to correct the hoax. Now, they don't say it in as direct a language as I'd like to, but they, they did finally include the clarification part where the president condemned, in the, in the strongest, you know, most clear words, he condemned the Nazis, neo-Nazis and, and white nationalists. So Wikipedia was the first win, I would say, in persuading against this hoax. But this week, we've seen articles in USA Today, Daily Wire, which is a uh, you know, pro-Trump sort of leaning organization, Washington Post, Vox, Real Politics, Real Clear Politics, uh, Breitbart, CNN, Jake Tapper, 
Fox News, at least the five, not all of Fox News, uh, and PolitiFact now. The fact-checking organization PolitiFact, I checked it today, and they have addressed this, but here's the hilarious part. In, oh, let, let me clarify. The organizations that I mentioned do not directly say we were completely wrong for the past two years. Instead, they simply run the clarification, uh, the second part of Trump's quote, so that you, the reader, can see that he clearly was excluding the racists and the, uh, or the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists. So uh, even though they write their articles to be sort of hit pieces on me, it's impossible to write that hit piece without saying what I said. And what I said is the debunking of the hoax. It's the statement where the president, where they always edit that part out usually, but they have to include it when they're talking about what a tinfoil hat wearing person that I am. And that is the, is the acknowledgement that the original hoax was not real. So it is now a point of record in the Washington Post, Vox, um, USA Today, Wikipedia, uh, Jake Tapper said it on the air. Um, they've all said that the original hoax, and I'm being very specific here, the hoax part that had been repeated for two years was that the President of the United States stood in front of the public, which is it's hilarious when you think about it, and actually said that the neo-Nazis and white nationalists were fine people, when in fact he said directly the opposite. So now that fact has been reported correctly, and I'm claiming success with all of you, with all of you, because this is you know a big group effort. But it looks like the... The uh, fine people hoax actually died this week because now it's, it's a point of record that he said the opposite, and it was never the point of record before. So thanks again, Joel Pollock, Steve Cortez, Carpe Dunctum. Amazing, amazing work. Now, it gets more fun. We're not done yet. If you've noticed, everybody who has at least acknowledged that the president said the opposite of what has been reported for two years... They acknowledge that, but do they say, well, we were wrong and we've said it wrong for two years? Of course not. You've seen almost everybody who was on the wrong side of this hoax uh, revert to cognitive dissonance. Now, cognitive dissonance is easy to spot once, you're, once you know what to look for. And it usually involves a hallucination, something that's not in evidence that only they can see. And you've seen it in the following words. The people who are, who are backing up from the hoax, okay, he did not call the neo-Nazis and white nationalists fine people. Okay, he said exactly the opposite and condemned them at that very same time. Okay, the hoax is not real, but they will always back up to a lower level uh, offense. And they'll say, why were those other people, those fine people that the president mentioned, why were they marching with the neo-Nazis? Why were they protesting alongside? Those are the two words you'll see the most. And so commonly, it looks like they coordinated. I don't think they did, but it looks like they all just hit on the same, the same uh, new hallucination. Now, here's what the hallucination part is. There is no reporting that there were people who were not actually with those groups who were physically marching with them. There is no, there is no reporting, nothing in evidence, that would suggest that they were protesting alongside them. Well, we do have an evidence, and I've actually confirmed, talking to a, an eyewitness, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment, but yesterday I had extended conversations with somebody who attended the Charlottesville event. Someone who is anti-racism, very strongly anti-racism. And he was there for the Unite the Right, what he thought was going to be just people on the right. Hard to believe, right? Here's the fun part. He's Jewish. I'll just let you process that for a moment. All right? Yeah, so his background is, uh, is largely Jewish. So... 
Now, I'll tell you more about him in a moment, but the first thing I want to tell you is that, uh, so he described what it was like. Apparently, when he showed up, which was the published start time, what he saw was chaos. At the, at, even before the official start time, the, the stuff was going down. There was mayhem, there were people everywhere. So although there were marchers who were organized at one part, I'm not even sure he saw them. There were just lots of people doing lots of things. And they weren't all wearing costumes. You couldn't tell that they were all, you know, the, 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 uh, the neo-Nazis who dressed the same way. That was just some of the people there. There were also Antifa, that you could probably tell who was more likely to be in that by the way they dressed, etc. But there were a whole bunch of people just wearing normal, what I'll call Republican clothes. <laughs> Does anybody know what they were thinking or why they were there? They do not. So, <clears throat> so when you see that the, the people who are selling the hoax for the past year have, um, have backed up to a safer position, they think, by saying, all right, but if you showed up for a Nazi event, you know, something that was billed as a, you know, as a unite the right uh, racist event, aren't you kind of a racist? Because you're sort of marching with them and alongside them. These two things are not in evidence. <clears throat> this is not news. This is people turning a question into a fact and hoping you don't notice. The question is, why were people there, and what were they thinking? The answer is, nobody really knows, all right? Um, here's, here's the thing that the news, who is still trying to sell the, the weakened version of this hoax, here's what they're trying to sell you right now. They're trying to sell you that if you took any group of 100 Americans who were in the same place, doesn't matter why, could be attending a concert, they could be in college. They could be attending a protest of this one or any other kind. If you take 100 people, Americans, do they all have the same opinions? They do not. Any group of 100 Americans are going to have opinions all over the place. Now, they might mostly have the same opinion. If, if a whole bunch of people go to a, you know, uh, a Taylor Swift concert and you were to ask them, why are you here? Well, most of them would say, I like Taylor Swift. I like music. But a whole bunch of them would say, I just came because my, you know, my girlfriend likes this person. Some would say, I don't know, my friend had tickets. I was in town. We didn't have anything to do. I'm not even a fan. Some would say, I just needed to get out of the house. I got a babysitter. There was nothing else happening, so I came here. The truth is, it's a lie to say that there were two opinions in Charlottesville. The two opinions being, were a bunch of racists or were protesting the racists. Any group of 100 people is going to have a lot of people thinking a lot of things. That's what the president said, in essence. Let me give you some examples. Um, <laughs> did you know that there was a clergy group in attendance at Charlottesville at the protests? Why was the clergy there? Well, the clergy was there for their own reasons. They were not the racists. They were not the counter-protesters, at least not in the physical sense. They were there to lend some kind of um, you know, good vibe, some calm, maybe bring a little godliness to the situation. They, they were there for their own reasons. If I had asked you, was there a group of clergy at the event? You wouldn't know, but it's America, folks. You put 100 people anywhere for any reason, and they're going to have all kinds of different motivations. Uh, there were a lot of locals that came, which I'll say a little bit more about. What were the locals thinking? What side were they on? It's not in evidence. There's no reporting on that. We don't know. How many were there? We don't know. There were locals. Uh, my favorite example was, and I think some of you know this, there was at least one black guy who went there on the side of keeping the statues. He was kind of a, with a, a free speech group. So they were very much not with the Nazis, and they were very much not with the white nationalists. And he was literally a black guy 
who knew exactly what the event was, and he came because he had his own reasons. Now, I, I, was, I was laughing to myself earlier as I was thinking about this, because how do you explain that? Was it a prank? I could see his friends saying, hey, hey Bob, wait, you want to join us at an event? And, and Bob says, what kind of event? Eh, it doesn't matter. It's just people are going to wear costumes, and there's going to be a march. And, and, and the black guy goes, oh, sounds fun. I'll go. And then, then it turns out it's a prank because it's a neo-Nazi march. The point is, that didn't happen. I just think it would be funny to think about it. The point is, 100 people have a lot of different reasons for why they're doing anything. And if you think that you can get in their heads and you can understand all of those other people and all of their complicated thoughts, that is purely imaginary. We can't do that. Let me put it to you this way. If I had been a local person and I lived in Charlottesville and I was trying to figure out what to do that night for entertainment, let's say I called my friend and I say, hey, I'm bored. What do you want to do? And friend says, I'm thinking of going to a movie. You want to go? And I think, I love movies. Yeah, that's a pretty good idea. But let me get back to you because I think I can get a better deal. So I call my other friend and say, hey, what are you doing? The other friend says, oh, we're going to go out to dinner with some friends, have some drinks. Do you want to come? And I think, that sounds great. I love going out to dinner. I love having drinks. That's even better than the movie. I'm in. But wait a minute. I can't confirm. Let me get back to you because you're still looking for a better deal. So you call your third friend and, third fr and say, hey, what are you doing tonight? And your third friend says, you won't believe this. Walking distance from my house, Antifa and a bunch of neo-Nazis are going to beat each other with sticks and, and blunt forces. And we're go I'm going to go watch. You want to come? And I'm going to say to myself, want to come? Are you freaking kidding me? Are you telling me that the two groups I hate more than any in the world, Antifa and racists, are going to actually meet in a public place where I can watch and they will beat themselves senseless with sticks? Are you freaking kidding me? You couldn't keep me from going to that thing. And, but I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, a second thought. This sounds dangerous. I, you know, isn't it going to be dangerous? And the friend says, no, here's the best part. The police are going to be there in force, but the only thing they're going to do is keep the, keep the, uh, keep the audience from getting hurt. And I say, the audience? Because yeah, yeah, you're just the audience. The police aren't even going to stop the fight. They're just going to make sure you don't get hurt while you're watching it. And I'm like, let me go to this event. So here's my point. I'm just joking. But in truth, watching ISIS, <laughs> I, I call uh, Antifa ISIS. Let, let me give you some context for that. Uh, ISIS is famous for blowing up the monuments of the territory that they capture. So it's, if it's some other religious group's monument and statue, they blow it up. The people who wanted to get rid of the Robert E. Lee statue and Antifa are weirdly on the same philosophical side as ISIS, which is that whoever's in charge gets to decide what's offensive, and then you get rid of it. So in the, in the same way that Antifa is sort of like the um, JV for ISIS, you know, ISIS is terrible and they behead people. They're, the, they're just the worst. But Antifa comes with masks, like ISIS. You know, like ISIS. They have weapons, like ISIS, but they're more like clubs and, and chains and bike locks and stuff. And they want to get rid of monuments that are offensive. And by the way, I agree that the monuments are offensive. I told you I'm left to Bernie. I'm anti-Confederate monument, and you know, I'm well documented for that. But you can't get past the fact that it's also ISIS's philosophy that the winning side gets to decide what's offensive and they'll get rid of any historical references to, to other monuments. So you've got Antifa, which is like a weak form of ISIS, and they're going to have a fight in a public place against neo-Nazis who, as bad as they are, and they're you know, murderous, terrible scum of the earth, but even they're not as bad as the actual Hitler Nazis and the Holocaust. Maybe they'd like to be, so they're you know, maybe just as bad in principle, but they're still the JV to the actual you know, 
Hitler Nazis. So watching those two groups, the JV of ISIS with clubs beating each other to death with the JV of the Nazis, oh, that's just a good time. If you could watch that, um, I would pay, I would do pay-per-view to watch that, and I would watch it every weekend. But that's just me. My point is, a lot of people have a lot of different reasons for, for doing anything. And if you assume that the people there were either with the Nazis or with Antifa, that's just a, a false uh, prison of two ideas, which uh, Greg Gottfeld often mentions on The Five. So, but here's, here's the kill shot. Are you ready for it? Here's the kill shot. It doesn't matter who was there. All that matters to the central question of what the president said and did about this event is what he reasonably assumed was true about that event. Because we can't check who was there. We don't know what they were thinking. Nobody did a survey. Nobody did a poll. No major news organization has done a deep dive to find people who were there and interview them. Nobody knew at the time who was there when the president made his comments. He didn't know exactly the composition of the crowd. Obviously, people knew the, the main players, but nobody knew the exact composition of the crowd. Today, nobody knows the composition of that crowd. Nothing changed. It was ambiguous then. It's ambiguous now. Now, the most reasonable um, assumption that a person could make about the nature of the crowd is if you knew that it was a protest for and against a Robert, F, a Robert E. Lee statue, a Confederate statue, the most reasonable assumption anybody could make is that there was a diverse group with all kinds of different opinions because that's America. Every group of big people in America have diverse opinions. You can't find an exception to that. All right? It's the most normal thing in America. So... You'll notice that the, the people were still trying to cling to some, you know, well, we were right, but in a completely different way. They're trying to make their case by looking at the facts of what happened while not having the facts of what happened. And they're doing it with, with the question method where they say, well, but why would anybody go to this event? The president made the most reasonable assumption you could make that it was a diverse group and they probably had all kinds of opinions and almost certainly, and I would say this is a certainty with that many people, there were a few people there, at least some people who were not racist who wanted to keep the statues. That is the most reasonable, common, normal, supportable assumption that any president or any person ever made. All right, And the, the press is trying to turn that into, yeah, but they were marching with or protesting alongside. So they're using these words to turn something fairly innocent into something very, very evil. And those words are not in evidence. There's no alongside reporting. There's no marching with reporting from that day. All right. Um, and I also know from my eyewitness that day that there were many people in normal clothing. So if you were there and you were looking at pictures, if you were looking at pictures where you attended, even you couldn't tell who was thinking what or why they were there. Their clothes didn't give it away. And it's not like everybody was holding a sign. You don't know what they were thinking. All right. Uh, let me tell you about this one fine person that I did talk to at length. I'm going to uh, keep this person's identity anonymous by mutual decision. You know, I wouldn't, even if he wanted to go public, I would advise against it because it's a, a dangerous place. Uh, I talked to him at length. Uh, I know his real name. I have seen his real picture. I've checked his social media existence to find out that, it's, that he's not a hoax. He's a real person. And I asked this person all of the questions that you would have asked him. Now, remember, he's got a Jewish background. So that's the first thing you need to know. So clearly, he's not with the neo-Nazis who are chanting anti-Semitic things. That part we can know for sure. <laughs> all right? But here are some of the questions and answers that I had. Um, 
I, I asked him how he could have looked at the uh, advertisements for the event, the posters, and not known that this was a, a racist organized event. And, and we had this weird Yanni and Laurel moment, which now you all understand how people can look at exactly the same thing and see completely different things looking at exactly the same thing. And so, and so I had that uh, Yanni and Laurel moment over the poster. I said, look at this poster. How is it not obvious that this is a racist, racist event? And I said, look at these little images of the eagles. There's, there's like some little, uh, you know, Nazi-looking eagles with some kind of a, you know, breastplate or something. And I said, isn't that obvious that it's sort of suggested by, you know, there's no there wasn't a swastika on it, but it seems suggestive of Nazi imagery. And he said, all I see is an American eagle. <laughs> and I said, come on, that's not just an ordinary American eagle. This is very much like you would expect if you saw, if you saw a movie about the Nazis, but it wasn't really the Nazis and they made up their own iconography. It would sort of look like that, wouldn't it? And he sends me an image of an, uh, of an American eagle with an angry look and holding a bunch of arrows in one hand and something else in the other hand. And I looked at it and I thought, yeah, I can see it. The, the irregular American eagle has many forms and this other thing was an eagle. And so I thought, is it possible that you could look at this thing and not see them as you know, sort of racist inspired? And the answer is, if 100 people look at Anything, they have different opinions. Anything, not just this icon, anything. A hundred people will have wildly different impressions of what they're looking at right on the page. So then I said, but what about the list of people who are organizing this? I mean, clearly, you just look at these names, and even if you didn't recognize them all, you'd see some questionable people here. And then I realized that not everybody knows who all those people are. <laughs> if you're a member of the press, if, you follow, if you're a political junkie, you, you might recognize some of those names and say, whoa, you know, I'd stay away from this one and this one. But if you only recognize one name on the list, and that was his case, he recognized one of the names on the list and knew that person was a speaker who was going to be a racist. But he's a free speech extremist as many people are. And by that I mean, uh, he would not avoid a place that had people talking that he violently disagrees with. Because it was an event in which everybody would be having their own opinion, he assumed. And he thought it said, unite the right. So he thought, well, it's going to be normal people and some terrible people, but it'll be people of all kind on the right. Now, personally, that, that uh, poster probably would have, not probably, would have kept me from going. But I have confirmed with one person that I consider reasonable, reasonable that there was a Yanni Laurel thing and it just wasn't obvious that all of, you know, that the organizers and that, that the primary identity of this thing would be full on racist. Then I asked the question that you're wondering, which is when he got there, when it was more obvious what was going on, why didn't he immediately turn and leave? That's a pretty reasonable question, right? You're, you've got a Jewish background. You show up at this event. Tiki Torch guys are, are saying anti-Semitic things. Why don't, why don't you turn and leave right away? And the answer is that it was already chaos at the starting bell. In other words, if you showed up on time, as he did, at the starting time, it was already just a mess. You know, there was, there was just people doing all kinds of things in different places, people running around. There was the press, the clergy, the two sides. You couldn't necessarily tell who, every time, who was on what side because people were wearing, you know, their regular clothes in most cases. And, and then he did leave fairly quickly. So there's your obvious answer, that when people showed up, you know, that the, the stuff had already gone down, it was already a fog of war, and they kind of did leave pretty quickly because there wasn't much reason to stay around. All right, let me, let me summarize this. I'm going to give you uh, the best response to the hoax 
from the position of, let's say, the president of the United States. So if I were president and I were in the situation and I saw this hoax dissolving and I just watched the, uh, the Russia collusion hoax completely dissolve, at least for reasonable people, it completely dissolved. Here's how I would respond. And so this will be a little lesson in persuasion. And I would do it in, in roughly this order. So the order that I say these things is going to be as important as the things that I say. All right. So take care to look at the order that I'm saying them. This is what I would say. I wrote it down so I'd remember it. I would start out by saying that the press, uh, a lot of the press, the ones I mentioned, including PolitiFact and Wikipedia, maybe you leave out Wikipedia, but certainly PolitiFact, have confirmed that the fine people hoax was fake news. So I would start right out and saying that the media has now confirmed that it was fake news. And when I'm, what I mean by that is that they've now started reporting the second part of the president's quote in which he clearly said the opposite of what had been reported for two years. So I think you can make that claim and, and that it's supportable because there are enough video clips and articles that have been written to say that the media now recognizes that was a hoax. Now, if that makes the media argue about that point, they will accidentally confirm the point in the process of arguing it. That's why you say it first. You, you put that provocative thought out there that is, first of all, completely supportable, because now they're, you know, you've, you've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of points that you can point to and links, etc., then I would mention that the Democratic candidates, uh, especially the human gaffe machine Joe Biden, continue to, to spread this hoax that has been debunked by the media, debunked by uh, PolitiFact, and uh, debunked by everybody who was paying attention. And then I would go right to the heart of it. This is the kill shot. So this is the important part. If you don't remember anything else I say, just remember this next sentence. It's the kill shot for the hoax. No one knew at the time, and no one knows now, exactly who attended the event. Do you, do you feel the power of that? I'm going to read it again. <laughs> no one knew at the time, and no one knows now, exactly who attended the event. That's the end of it. That's the end of the conversation. But I'll, I'll, let's wrap it up. <laughs> and I would, I would point out that President Trump made the most normal assumption you could make, that it was a diverse group, because this is America. This is America. You put 100 Americans in one place, don't expect the same opinion. <laughs> don't expect that. Um, and he made the assumption that there would be at least some people there who were just there to support the statue who are non-racist. The most normal assumption you could make. That's what the president made, the most normal assumption. Um, and then I, then I would point out that if the press were investigators instead of journalists, uh, playing on the uh, quote from CNN's boss, uh, I would say that they would know who was exactly at that event. But they don't. Um, instead, because they didn't investigate, they're just journalists, They've, uh, they've retreated to pure imagination in which they imagined that all the protesters were marching together. That didn't happen. It's just the, ne it's the next version of fake news to protect themselves from the, the shame of, pr of promoting horrible fake news for two years on top of the Russia collusion hoax. Uh, you could point out that... Um, the event was chaos from the start, and all we know for sure is that there were a lot of people with different opinions in the same zip code at the same time, which is very different from marching together. That's worth noting. Um, and then I would say that uh, I would finish by, by stating again this fact, and I will add one thing to it to make it more powerful. And if I were, let's say, a spokesperson, I'd say, as the president said after Charlottesville, and I would go back to his original quote, quote, he condemns totally the neo-Nazis and white nationalists. So reminding people that he said that in direct language at the time, and then add this. 
in the interest of absolute clarity and completeness, if anyone was literally marching with that crowd, he condemns them as well. Why not? Why not just go ahead and say, yeah, if in the interest of completeness, if anybody was marching with that crowd, I condemn them as well. Now, people are still going to say, why did it take you so long? But if that's all they have left, the hoax is dead. So the, the, the main hoax is completely dead. The media has now run the second part of the quote, which is the hoax killer, that he said the opposite of what they've been uh, reporting. Now they've retreated to marching with, or why did anybody attend, or were they protesting alongside? Those are imaginary. There's no evidence of that. There was evidence of chaos. There was evidence that people were in the same zip code. If they're Americans, they were there for all kinds of different reasons. The president made the most reasonable assumption you could make, that people were there for different reasons. Nobody knows exactly the composition of the crowd. Worst case scenario, he got a fact wrong that any reasonable person would have thought was the way he said it, which is it was a diverse crowd. I believe that thanks to the completely lucky combination of events, that the Russia collusion hoax collapsed at around the same time as Biden, the human gaffe machine, tried to push, push the second most damaging hoax in American history, probably, probably the second most damaging hoax after the Russia collusion, that that primed the public for the first time to see the second part of the quote. And now they've all backed up to, well, but why were people even there? And the answer to that is 100 Americans, any place, are going to have different opinions. No doubt about it. All right. I'm going to end on that because I'd like to keep this to one point. And let's uh, congratulate each other for good work. And by the way, thank you to all of you who watch this Periscope. Thank you sincerely to those who retweet anything uh, I, that is on this topic. You are patriots, and you have corrected the record. And what you've done is amazing. <clears throat> so th uh, shout out again, Joel Pollock, Steve Cortez, Carpe Dunctum, all the people who, who helped, all the people who retweeted. You have killed the second biggest hoax in American history. <laughs>